Good afternoon. May I ask you to take your seats? Would like to start with the session. So welcome, everybody. Since uh, 2006, we closed this uh, conference with the uh, uh, Mendel Lecture. So this goes to a lecturer who contributed really a significant part to human genetics. And the last 16 years, we hosted some really giants in human genetics, including six Nobel Prize laureates. It makes me a privilege to introduce uh, this year's uh, Mendel lecturer, Jay Chandri. He is a professor of genome sciences at the University of Washington, investigator at the Howard Hughes Institute of Medicine, and the director uh, of the Allen Center uh, for Cell Lineage Tracing. He's a re renowned innovator in the field of genomic medicine. At the beginning of, he, of his career, he joined our past uh, Mendel lecturer, George Church, and contributed significantly to the development of next generation sequencing. Later on, he established his own lab and discovered exome sequencing. He also demonstrated that this approach can be very sufficiently used for finding new genes, even in a very small families. He demonstrated that back 2010, finding the genes for Kabuki and Miller syndromes. And since then, hundreds of genes and molecular mechanisms for diseases have been identified. And not only that, the exome sequencing actually revolutionized the early diagnosis of rare genetic disorders, which significantly improved life for millions of people with rare disorders worldwide. He also pioneered cell-free uh, DNA diagnostic for cancer and reproductive uh, medicine purposes. And in addition, he used genome technologies for single cell and lineage profiling, which he and his team apply to reconstruct the animal and human development. And that will be also the major topic uh, he'll present today. He's a recipient of several awards, I will not name all, uh, but just a few. Kurt Stern Award from the American Society of Human Genetics, NIH Director's Pioneer Award, and Richard Lounsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences. We are honored to have you, Jay, today with us. So uh, please give a warm welcome to this year Mendel Lecturer, Jay Shandri. Okay, thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. I'll just go ahead and get started here. There we go. Okay. Um, terrific to be here. Uh, very glad to have a chance to, to um, receive this award. I'm uh, very honored and, and, and look forward to the chance to tell you about some of our recent work. Uh, so title here, Next, Next Generation Genetics. Um, so I thought, you know, just to kind of contextualize, you know, if there's one kind of message I hope to get across here, so this is a quote from Cindy Brenner um, that I think many of you have probably heard about progress in science being developed, dependent on, 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 you know, not just new ideas and discoveries, but, but 
critically techniques, methods. And that's been kind of the overarching theme of our lab's work has really been on that first uh, uh, topic of, of technology or methods development as kind of a rate limiter um, in, for progress in genetics uh, and one that if we can you know, make, make strides, then, then we can hopefully uh, uh, accelerate the whole field. And so you know, one theme I'd like to have here is technology. The second theme is hopefully to have you think about how technologies scale as being a critical factor in terms of what they're actually able to do over the long run, right? And so many of the things we've worked on have had kind of humble origins, but um, because of the way they've been able to scale, uh, I think they've ended up um, going far uh, relatively quickly. So since this is a Mendel lecture, I thought I'd start with Mendel, right? So um, it's kind of fun to think about the fact that at some level, we are, you know, we're still engaging in this same exercise, right, that, that Mendel started of connecting genotypes to phenotypes. It's just that we've gotten more sophisticated about how we approach each of these, you know, axes of, of this um, uh, 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 diagram. So kind of starting with genotype, if you just think about the technologies that we have used over the years, right, starting with uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, um, uh, tandem repeats, and then SNPs, um, measured through different methods, and then finally um, culminating in, in next generation sequencing, which allows you to capture all variation. So as alluded to in the uh, introduction, um, kind of early in my uh, career as a graduate student, I had the chance to work with uh, George Church and uh, Rob Mitra and Greg Pareka shown here on, on some of the earliest uh, versions of sequencing by synthesis of PCR-derived colonies, right, which we now call um, NGS. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of scaling, right, these are some of the first uh, sequencing reads with this kind of method, and these are, you know, the equivalent of the, the clusters that we have today, but they're millimeter scale in size, and we we're only able to do uh, four to six base pair reads, right? Then a few years later, uh, uh, with, with Greg, we developed, you know, we we're able to get this up to millions in micron scale, but still 13 base pair reads, and we're now only, you know, 15, 20 years later, and, and and you know you can you can obviously do a lot more. And at the time, I don't think even even as the students developing it, I don't think we've really appreciated the potential for what you could do with miniaturizing this kind of method. But George, you know, forced us to put the sentence in the paper saying, if we could only miniaturize this by a factor of a billion, then we could you know sequence a thousand dollar genome, right? And he was absolutely right. We just couldn't see it at the time. Um, okay, so that's that's genotyping. Um, kind of the other category of activity here is how you connect genotype to phenotype, right? And there are various modalities for this, starting with linkage mapping, which was followed by Q QTL mapping and then, and then GWAS studies. And then the other axis here, of course, has more recently been exome sequencing. And so this was uh, uh, something that was one of the earliest projects in, in my own uh, independent lab. That's Sarah Eng, who was my first graduate student. And uh, uh, focusing, you know, Miller sy syndrome is one example where a relatively small number of of proband, so here we only were sequencing on the order of uh, three or four cases, and then maybe uh, seven or eight um, uh, uh, HapMap uh, controls. But just with, with that small number of exomes, one could narrow down to um, a handful of genes that had the potential to be causative under a few assumptions, right? Like this was 100% penetrant and, and um, a single gene disorder, right? And so that, as, as has been mentioned, that has gone on to um, be the basis for a lot of disease gene discovery. Um, but again, I think an example of a technology that can scale, right? So in a single lab, doing you know, 10 or 12 exomes was quite an effort, um, but now this is something that can go to the scales of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So another sort of going back to genotyping, right? And this will, this will kind of allude to what, what my lab has spent a lot of time on in the last five years or so is what I would call synthetic variation, right? So human genetics historically has really relied on natural variation, so the variation that's present in us and out in the world, right? And, and that's limiting in some ways. Um, and so one can also think about simply engineering variation into the genome and, and looking for functional effects in that way. And so just examples of that kind of work. So uh, Greg Finley is a former graduate student now at the Crick Institute, and, um, and I think his work's been presented at this meeting, um, showing BRCA1 saturation genome editing as a means of basically pre-creating every possible mutation in a clinically relevant gene, pre-measuring the functional consequences as a way of effectively pre-computing a clinical prediction for the first time you see that variant in a patient rather than needing to rely on, on uh, earlier observations in patients to make a judgment. And then another um, 
more re slightly more recent example of that, this is work from Molly Gasparini, who is a graduate student in the group, is CRISPR-QTL, um, uh, which is a method essentially of taking advantage of CRISPR to not just engineer one mutation, but to put in thousands of mutations or epimutations into not people, but populations of cells, but then still using the framework of genetics to associate particular perturbations with particular outcomes, right? And this is something I'll kind of come back to at the end. So, okay, so that's genotyping and how we connect genotypes to phenotypes. There's kind of two frontiers where I think it's a reasonable case that can be made that technology has had um, an outsized impact in kind of driving the field forward. Um, so that, you know, the, 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 the final frontier here arguably is phenotype, right? Where um, I think one could make the case that how we phenotype, at least compared to how we genotype and how we, you know, make these connections has remained comparatively crude, right? This is pictures from the, um, uh, I think from a, uh, m m the same syndrome in a mouse and uh, a human from the, um, I think these images are from the 1980s, um, but, uh, you know, we're still kind of phenotyping in, in, you know, visual ways rather than molecular and cellular ways for the most part. Um, okay, so what's the best we could do in terms of phenotyping? What's the extreme, right? And so this, you may recognize this, this is the Selston lineage of worm. So this is the complete description of the wild type development of C. elegans, uh, painstakingly um, uh, put to, uh, with pen and paper and Nomarski microscopy by John Selston over the course of several years, right? This, this is an invariant lineage, always happens the same way every time. And this is kind of the extreme example of the best we could do with phenotyping, right? Obviously something you can do in a worm, the two years to do one wild type worm, um, so not terribly scalable, right? Um, so in addition to scalability, we'd also like to do, you know, something like that, comprehensive phenotyping on uh, uh, a model organism that's closer to the human, so something like a mouse, right? And so the challenges here are, um, are, are obvious, right? The, re the relative challenges, so one, um, uh, C. elegans development is, is uh, transparent, so you can see the whole thing. Um, the mouse is opaque. Um, uh, C. elegans development al always happens at the same time. Wild-type mice, um, uh, even genetically identical mice, do not develop exactly the same way. And then obviously there's a question of, of scale in terms of the size of the organism, right? So the worm is only 1,000 cells, and an adult mouse is on the order of 10 uh, billion cells, right? But nonetheless, from a technology development perspective, this is a, kind of an exciting challenge. So a lot of what our group has been focused on for the last couple of years is thinking about how to develop technologies that allow one to, to, to comprehensively um, uh, interrogate the phenotype uh, of a mouse um, at the whole organism scale, right? So if we just take a step back and think about a few ways we might approach this, right? So one is to um, observe mouse development through microscopy, but because again, because of the, the, the lack of transparency, that's difficult. Um, another one is to sample, right? To actually take a mouse embryo, wild type or mutant, at a particular time point and try and analyze the whole thing, right? And so here we've been, we've been doing this leveraging the power of uh, uh, single cell technologies, which I think as, as many of you probably know, have really taken off in the last couple of years kind of in a manner reminiscent of the early days of next generation sequencing, where there's been a real proliferation of the, the, the scale and scope of different technologies, different approaches to this, uh, but the, the sizes of the studies uh, blowing up, this is a logarithmic scale, over really just a handful of years, right? And so um, our lab, um, uh, largely in combination or, or in collaboration with Cole Trapnell's group, also at, at UW, has really focused in on a particular strategy that we believe for the long run has a good shot of being eminently scalable. So kind of like next generation sequencing was scalable. And so the basic idea is that we start with, uh, we're profiling single cells without ever actually isolating a single cell. So in contrast with something like 10X genomics, there's no droplet in which we're isolating a single cell. So here we take cells and we distribute them to wells of a plate. We perform some kind of molecular barcoding or indexing of the nucleic acids inside those cells. So you can see every well gets a different color, corresponding to kind of a different tag that we've introduced to its, its RNA, let's say. And then we pool the cells together, split them out to a new set of wells, and perform another round of barcoding. And then we can do this again and again. And the key point is that over the course of this kind of pooling and splitting of the cells, 
Each cell, just by chance, ends up traversing a unique combination of wells and therefore receives a unique combination of barcodes, right? And at the end, we can sequence the nucleic acids and we can group the reads that share the same barcodes and know that they came from the same cell, right? So it seems kind of complicated, so why do it this way? So there's a couple different reasons. So one is that uh, it's a highly technical, versatile uh, way of approaching single cell analysis. So you might know that other, other methods have largely been focused on RNA, right? We have been able to extend this basic idea of, of splitting and pooling of cells from nuclei, we and others in the field, um, to not only gene expression, but also chromatin accessibility, uh, Hi-C, uh, DNA sequence, methylation, um, ChIP-seq, um, uh, and, and other phenomena that one might be interested in analyzing at, at single cell resolution. And then the other point, just going back to that theme of how something will scale over the long run, right? So you can, you can imagine that, um, just going back here a slide, that if we, have, you know, if we have some decent number of wells at each round, the number of combinations that we can traverse over the course of these rounds will go up not linearly, but rather exponentially, right? So here, there are three times three times three, or 27, 27 possible combinations, but if I had 96 wells at each round, it would be 96 to the third power, and, and so on and so forth, right? So the numbers can get very big very quickly. And so we've leveraged that to uh, conduct, um, to create kind of whole organism single cell atlases, primarily focused on embryogenesis for a variety of model organisms. So starting with the worm, but then also uh, the fly, um, and then the mouse, and then uh, in addition, extensive sampling of, of human fetal tissues, um, both for gene expression as well as chromatin accessibility. So I won't, you know, for reasons of time, I won't have a chance to talk about all of this work, but I'm just gonna focus in on the mouse in particular, um, and one particular experiment that kind of, I think, opened our eyes to the potential of this general approach, right? So this was work from uh, Jin Yu Kao, who's now got his own lab at Rockefeller, um, uh, and Malta Spielman, who's, who's here and is uh, running uh, genetics in, in Lubeck. Um, and when they were in the lab just a few years ago, they performed this experiment trying to profile whole mouse embryos um, with 384 by 384 by 384 single cell um, combinatorial uh, indexing, right? And so 384 to the third power, if you, if you pull out your calculator, ends up being 56 million, right? So we could profile two million cells in this experiment and not even get close to sort of saturating the combinatorial space that was potentially there, right? So it's one nice thing here. And then another nice thing is that, that because of the way that this, this, uh, these experiments work, we can drop the cells from every embryo into a different well on this first round of barcoding. So we could end up profiling you know, a, a good number of embryos in kind of one shot or one uh, experiment. And then the last point to mention is that you know, even though two million cells, you know, I think this is still one of the largest data sets of its kind that's, that's out there, was all done you know, by, by someone sitting in a bench, you know, one or two people kind of conducting this experiment over the course of a week, right? So it wasn't a production scale effort, it was one experiment, right? Um, one you know, graduate student experiment. So, yeah, so in particular, and, and Malta really encouraged us to focus on this particular window of mouse development, these four days, E9.5 to E13.5, which is this post-gastrulation period of, of major organogenesis, right, that Les has understood about. And this is our first uh, look at the data. So this is a, one of these T-SNE plots. So every point is a single cell. And in principle, the cells should be clustered by... Um, uh, by, by transcriptional similarity, right? And you can see that they are. Uh, to an extent, we have these discrete clusters and Malta was able to go through and, and somewhat painstakingly annotate these. And for the most part, we see the things that we expect and the proportions that we expect to see them. Yet it's a little bit challenging to re relate this kind of image to actual development. So if you look, for example, at different neuronal cell types, they're somewhat all over the place in this, in this map, right? And so um, working with Cole, uh, had just developed a, a new version of this algorithm, uh, Monocle 3. And so this is a fun uh, 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 video he made of transforming the exact same data. So exact same data set, just a different algorithm, right? And I think it illustrates how if you look at your data, well, one, it's cooler to look at your data in 3D than 2D. But in addition to that, um, you can see that kind of where the clusters are has changed a lot. And in particular, there's kind of almost less complexity in this image where we, we now have these 10 rather well-separated groups that make much more sense developmentally in terms of the groupings, right? So uh, one of these corresponds to, um, let's go to a second here, 
the lens, three to different subsets of the neural crest, another to all of hematopoiesis, endothelium, epithelium, hepatocytes are a cluster floating above the rest of the mesenchyme, and then finally all of the neuronal cell types, all of the neural tube derivatives are in, are in one place, right? And we can also start to see the dimension of time. So if we just focus in on epithelium and recluster it, we get, we, you know, reanalyze re it with the same algorithm, we get this. And you can see, of course, there are many different kinds of epithelia uh, in this time window, but we see, you know, kind of this very nice progression from you know, this kind of rainbow layer cake from E9.5, 10.5, 11, 12, 13, so on and so forth. So really kind of characterizing wild-type development in its, in its entirety for this window. And a lot of our subsequent work um, on the wild-type mouse has been on um, doing this for additional time points, taking in data from other, other sources, and trying to build um, effectively a pseudo-tree. It's not a real lineage tree. We're sort of making inferences about the relationships between cell types but going all the way from zygote uh, out to pup eventually, right? So we'll have a strong handle on, on wild-type development. Okay, so what does this do for genetics? So I think, um, so Jana Henk, uh, who is a, a graduate student with Malta Spielman, I think gave a terrific talk at the start of this meeting um, about this work, so I'm not gonna um, uh, repeat it all here, but we have been able to leverage the same kind of platform for systematic phenotyping of mutants at this whole embryo scale, right? And here, rather than putting mutants from different, sorry, rather than putting wild-type mice from different time points into each well, we are putting um, mutant embryos uh, into different wells and doing all of the profiling in kind of a single shot, right, for a diversity of phenotypes. Um, and uh, 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 this has been a collaboration between um, uh, Malta's lab, uh, Jun's lab, and, and, and our lab, um, but really trying to reframe the question of how we um, systematically profile developmental mutants into something where we're looking at the, the whole organism level at all trajectories and then trying to analyze all of the mutants together to be able to shed light not only on individual phenotypes but also on commonalities and phenomena like pleiotropy, right? And then just one example of that which I think um, uh, Jana uh, had also highlighted uh, as just a clear, a clear case here. So here on the left is um, uh, uh, reduced dimensionality representation of just the mesenchyme and you can see the different, different cell types all at E13.5. Uh, this, is, this is from wild type as well as many mutants. But if we just highlight one mutant, the SOX9 regulatory inversion, we can see stalling essentially of undifferentiated mesenchyme in that particular mutant, right? So it's a powerful uh, way of, of systematically picking up this kind of thing. Okay, so, so this is one example of, I think, scalable approaches for future phenotyping at kind of this whole organism level, granted that we're restricted to model organisms. Um, uh, but, you know, is this enough is kind of the next question. So one, one limitation here, right, so as I alluded to a little bit, this is a pseudo tree, right? We, you know, for the experiment that, that Jana talked about and I, I, I briefly touched on, we ended up picking a single time point, E13.5, and profiling whole embryos at that time point, right? We have to choose that time point. And there are things that we probably would have missed, we're probably missing that we would have picked up if we went with a later or earlier time point. And obviously it's impractical to do every time point for every mutant, that's one problem. And the second problem is that we're kind of making these inferences about how cells are related to each other when the cells are derived from different mice, right? And that's not the same as what Selston did where he was actually watching every cell and had unequivocal information about how every cell was related to every other cell in the development of an individual embryo, right? So that kind of brings us to our, or, or, yeah, so that I made this point already, so developmental snapshots are limited to one, one time point. Um, this brings us to our third kind of approach here that we might take of recording. So can we take a single, single embryo and record information to its genome about its development analogous to a flight recorder on an airplane? right, where you're picking up some rich history about what happened to that airplane, should it ever crash, that you can then use to reconstruct, you know, some sequence of events. So here we're trying to do that to the genome. Okay, so we're not the first, you know, this is an old field, right, where, where, where for decades people have been trying DNA-based molecular recording, so going back to Walsh and Sepko in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, but also anything that uses Cree locks or flip FERT, um, you're essentially you know, you're, you're making a mark on the genome about uh, a cell type specific event and then using that to drive a reporter or what have you. So um, 
a few years ago now, um, uh, and I should say this was actually my first project in graduate school, but I, I gave up on it after six months. This is all pre-CRISPR, uh, but trying to do this kind of lineage recording at scale, um, but came back to it in our own lab about, about 10 or 15 years later, and in particular, uh, Aaron McKenna and, and again, Greg Finley, um, working with Jamie Gagnon and, and Alex Shear, uh, came up with this method called Gestalt, which the goal is organism scale multiplex cell lineage tracing, where we're trying to record information about cell lineage, a la Selston, to the genome using CRISPR, right? So you can imagine, so imagine here we have an egg, fertilized egg, and we're injecting CRISPR reagents into the egg, and we've engineered into the genome of the organism a, a transgenic barcode of CRISPR target sites. And so editing starts as the organism is starting to, to develop and the first cell is starting to divide. And so you get accumulation of edits to this barcode, right, just by cutting and repair. And you can imagine that, let's say we're following this particular lineage, it will accumulate some set of stochastic edits, primarily deletions and insertions, to this transgenic barcode, right? But some other lineage might accumulate some other set of edits. And so this is actual data where you can see across many cells from one, in this case, this is a zebrafish, uh, we can see different edits. But you can see that in different cells, there's a lot of sharing. And so that sharing can tell us something about the developmental relationships between the cell types, right? So we can essentially build, you know, akin to building a family tree of individuals or species, we can build a family tree of cells based on shared patterns of edits. All of the cells in this clade share this middle deletion, for example, but subsets share other deletions. And so we can make inferences about their relative relationships to one another, right? So at the scale of a whole fish, this looks something like this. We're not, at this time, we weren't able to track every cell, and there's lots of kind of technical problems I'll talk about in a minute here. But we could build, you know, these decent trees in which we were marking early progenitors of zebrafish development, and then kind of seeing what happened to them and able to relate them to each other in this kind of early uh, uh, lineage tree. Um, and again, kind of early days for this field, but we were, all, we were already able to see some interesting things. So here, for example, if we forget about the tree and just look at kind of treating every barcode, every unique barcode as kind of a clade, defining some number of cells, you can see that early on in the development of the zebrafish, there's a lot of c complexity, right? What you, what you call like high, essentially, um, uh, 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 high complexity, a lot of diversity in terms of where the cells come from relative to those early progenitors. But by the time this fish is an adult, that complexity has greatly reduced. So there's been some major remodeling where certain clones or lineages have largely taken over the organism, right? And if we break this down into individual organs, it's even more severe. So the blood, for example, it's just five early progenitors that explain nearly all the blood in the adult fish. And even in the brain, which you would think would be very complex, it's less than a dozen early progenitors that explain over half of the cells in the adult zebrafish brain, right? So there's still a lot of mysteries here about what's, what's going on here that we would need a better lineage to, to actually get to the bottom of. Okay, so this method, this is now, you know, this was in 2016, so six, seven years, and many groups have developed kind of related methods, uh, also based on CRISPR-based lineage uh, recording with these double-stranded breaks. And all of these methods suffer from kind of a shared set of problems, right? So you can kind of see the raw data here, and these, these red marks are deletions, and this is our whole barcode. Um, and so you can see the problems, you know, trying to, imagine trying to build a tree from this, which is kind of our, our challenge, right? The edits are stochastic, so CRISPR is just kind of editing along this array of targets. Um, and so we don't really know the order in which they are occurring, we have to infer that order. Um, you have double-stranded breaks, which can lead to these large deletions which are kind of deleting information along our array, right? That's a problem. Um, there are other problems, right? If we want to record a high resolution lineage, we need a lot of editing, but if we have a lot of editing, we destroy our array, and so it's a catch-22. And then finally, you know, we're recording lineage, but we're not actually recording anything about the cells that are traversing development, right? We're simply recording the relationships between each other. We're not saying anything about what enhancers are active or what signaling pathways are active at particular parts along the lineage. So imagine instead of kind of the system I just described, we had a different approach. And so we call this DNA typewriter. And uh, this was developed by Jun Hong Choi as a postdoc in the group. And this is a little more like a typewriter. Okay, so now imagine we have, this is, consider this like your paper or your tape. And 
we are writing like, very analogous to a typewriter typing letters along a sheet of paper. We are writing symbols to the tape along the DNA. So the DNA is our paper, and we are editing in a defined order along the DNA. Okay? And moreover, imagine that, that it wasn't arbitrary edits, but rather we could actually encode information to the symbols that we were writing to the tape, much like a letter that you type is encoding information, right? So, so to, to do this, to, to reduce the system of practice, we've been relying on prime editing, which was developed by David's Luz lab a few years ago. So this is very similar to Cas9 genome editing, except it relies on a fusion between Cas9 and a reverse transcriptase. And you don't need to worry about the details if you're not familiar with this, but the main point to remember is that the advantage of prime editing is it allows you to encode both the site that you're editing and the edit that you want to introduce within a single molecule, right? So you can say, I want to edit here, and I want to put in this change. And so we've been using prime editing in particular to encode insertions, okay? And the insertions are our, our information-bearing symbols. So um, I think for reasons of time, I'm not going to go through the molecular details in, in too much detail, but the, 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 key, the key points here is that we are, we are basically, um, we have an array of a tandem array, so much like a, a sequence tandem repeat of 14 MERS, and that is our tape. But only one site along the tape is kind of complete or active and, and amenable to editing. And then every, at every time the, 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 the prime editor writes to this, we are inserting information in the form of a barcode, and we're also moving our active site down by one unit along the tandem array. Right? And this approach has many advantages over the Gestalt approach. We have no double-stranded breaks. This all works with nicking rather than double-stranded breaks. The edits are ordered. So much like the Hox locus, right, the order in which things are happening is the order along the genomic DNA, right? in this case, the order in which they happened. And we only have one editing site at a time, right? Only this right head, analogous to like the type pad of a typewriter, is active at any given moment, then we get edit, it moves down, we get edit, it moves down, and so on and so forth, right? So we've overcome our, our issues. Okay, so does this work? And so, you know, many things take a while to work out. In this case, this experiment actually worked the very first time. So we came up with the idea, we put the construct in, tried it, and it immediately worked. Doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. So one thing we can look at is whether we get, you know, how do we know it's working? And we can ask whether we get, so this is our, this is our tape, we have three monomers here, and we're trying to write edits to them. And we can ask whether the edits happen in a directional pattern or kind of in a non-directional pattern. So in the directional patterns, you can see, in order to have the second site edited, you must have had the first site edited. Whereas over here, you can go straight to the third site. And if we look at our sequencing reads, after we try this, this typewriter approach, we actually get overwhelmingly directional patterns. Right? So that convinces us that we're processively marching along the DNA or the tape, analogous to a typewriter, analogous also to a polymerase. Okay, so what can we do with this? Can we actually infer the order of events? So this is kind of a mock experiment where we basically performed 16 transfections with different peg RNAs encoding different insertions. So 16 factorial is 21 trillion. So there are 21 trillion possible orders we could have used, but we picked just one of these. We perform the experiment, and then we ask whether we could decode the actual order, right? So here, for example, if we're trying to figure out whether the, you know, this, this, this peg RNA corresponding to a TC insertion came before or after the GA um, uh, insertion or, or transfection, these are the two possible orders. And we can look at whether we, we, you know, do we tend to see this one first or this one first? And we overwhelmingly in the data see this one first, this pattern which tells us, ah, TC must have been transfected before GA. And we can do this, you know, we can do this kind of analysis on all possible pairs of the 16 peg RNAs and actually decode the correct order. It's kind of a mock experiment, but it still allows us to see that, that the system is useful for recording order, right? Another kind of fun experiment was trying to record text messages, right? So here, um, you know, so first thing said on the telephone, Mr. Watson, come here. So we made up a fake alphabet uh, where we're encoding different letters with different three nucleotide insertions. And then we perform a series of transfections. And then we try and take the sequencing data and decode 
the text message that we had tried to write to the DNA. Um, and, you know, we're not perfect, so Mr. Watson, Comey, he, right? So, but, but pretty close um, uh, to that decoding. And then, you know, we kind of had fun with this. Um, so that was Bell's first call. We also did uh, What Hath God Wrought, which was the first long distance telegram uh, sent by Morse. And then I was trying to get uh, Choi to, to do, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times because we're in the pandemic, but that was too long. And he wanted to do a K-pop lyric, so we did Bound Forever DNA, um, which ended up being nearly perfect. Um, uh, but that, that kind of thing. Okay, so this is, not, this is not lineage yet, but it's still kind of a fun thing you can do with the system. Okay, so now lineage reconstruction. So going back to kind of what I showed before with a, a, a lineage accumulating information to some barcode over development, but here different than the Gestalt system, right? Here we're actually writing symbols in order, which is useful for when we actually try to reconstruct what happened, right? And so um, uh, uh, without going into to too much technical detail here, basically we're starting, this is, all in, this is not yet in an organism, so the goal is to do this in a mouse. We're not there yet. So here we're just starting with a single monoclonal cell line in which we have integrated many of these tapes and we're allowing that, we're basically in the end have about 50, you know, 11 of these tapes kind of operating in parallel. And then we're allowing that single cell to grow up to a million cells. And then we're performing single cell sequencing on some subset of those million cells, including reading out these barcodes. And then we're trying to reconstruct a tree. So this is the kind of data we get. So every row here is a single cell. And these are the ticker tape barcodes. And you can see that there's, you know, there's a bunch of them operating in parallel. But within each of the ticker tapes, so this group of five here, you can see the edits are accumulating in order. And similar to Gestalt, they allow us to build a tree, but it's much cleaner. We don't have these big deletions, right? Um, and, and, and we can see that we, you know, we can effectively build a tree using much more straightforward algorithms than we had to use before. And the other point here is it's much more scalable. So the resolution here isn't great, but this is kind of the, this is a full tree of roughly 3,000 cells. Um, uh, where we can, you know, this is again kind of a single experiment, um, but we're very able, quickly able to go to this tree in kind of one shot. And so at this point, there's no reason, because we already know we can profile millions of cells, we should be able to scale this to a much larger um, uh, kind of tree, right? But this is already kind of Sulston-like in, in, in scale. So uh, uh, just for reasons of time, I may go over this a little bit quickly, but we're, we're recording without exhausting the recording media. So we've been, here we've been recording an expansion from one cell to a million cells, 25 days of continuous recording, so longer than the gestational period of a mouse, which is kind of the key factor. And we're not, we're not exhausting our tape, right? We still have leftover media at the end of this experiment. And moreover, um, this is I think one of the coolest things from the experiment, is that if we look at how many mutations accumulate in each cell, right? It's an average of 40. So we have 40 informative edits in each cell, but they're distributed in a Poisson-like fashion. The variance equals the mean. And this is important because it tells us that this might be obeying like a clock-like property, right? Because this is, this is time-dependent processes tend to have Poisson distributions where we're just accumulating in some stochastic way, which if this, if this all were to work is, a, is a, a, a great property to have. Okay, so quickly coming back to the, the question, those are all stochastic signals, so there were kind of stochastically writing symbols, and then trying to rebuild a tree based on those, those symbols. Can we write biological information as well, right? So here, uh, the challenge is that the peg RNAs are all, generally guide RNAs used in mammalian systems. We tend to express them with Paul three promoters, which are ubiquitously expressed. Whereas the things that we might want to make signal specific are all based on Paul two promoters. So if we want to record signaling pathways or developmental enhancers or that kind of thing. So I won't go into the details for reasons of time, but Will Chen, a graduate student in the group, developed an approach that effectively acts as a signal converter and allows us to take Paul II driven signals and write signal specific edits to our tape. And so we can use this to record things like NF kappa B activity, Wnt signaling, right? So recording signal transduction activity to genomic DNA. We can also use it to record um, the activity of I'm gonna skip ahead of you a little bit, but we can use it to record the activity of enhancers, right? So this is analogous to a massively parallel reporter assay, except now this is a massively parallel recorder assay where we're recording the activity of enhancers to genomic DNA. And because every, every, every enhancer in this kind of system 
encodes a different insertion, we essentially can encode very large numbers of signals within a single system, right? So we're now up to about six base pair insertions. Four to the sixth is 4,096, which means that at least in principle, we can encode as many as 4,000 or so different signals to the same system. So where is this headed, right? So what we're trying to do now is to build what we're calling a molecular flight recorder locus, where we have both stochastic signals and signal-specific signals being driven to this common tape and then using the resulting information to, to reconstruct a tree that is essentially decorated with information about what happened along the way. So not only having a lineage tree, but knowing that in particular parts of the tree, wind signaling was active or, or NF-kappa B was active or, or what have you, or, or particular developmental enhancers were active. So that's where we're kind of headed. Again, kind of trying to get this in the mouse um, and to be able to record the history of an organism to its genome. Um, uh, and if we were able to do this, you know, we could record the, the key advantage over profiling single embryos at the whole embryo scale is that we'd be recording, we'd be measuring not only the present, but also the past, right? And in principle, you could build these trees between wild type and mutant and compare them to each other and not only know what is wrong at the current time point in development, but also what went wrong and when exactly it happened in terms of that decorated lineage tree. And so that's kind of, that's where we're headed for this, this last angle here of, of, um, uh, of genetics on the, on the phenotype side. And I think, the, I think the possibilities are really profound over the coming years. You know, we've arguably kind of gone the distance on, on variation and have these incredible approaches for associating variation with phenotypes. But at least for model organisms, at least if we're able to solve the phenotype problem, I think the possibilities are really profound. Um, but still essentially doing the same thing, right? Just with new, new tools. Um, and then lastly, very last slide here, I'll just very briefly um, highlight where I think the field could be going. And uh, you know, the question you might be asking is, well, that's great for your mice, but can I do this in a human? Um, and a lot of the things we talked about you can't do in a human, um, but I've just been blown away and we've been doing some of this in our own group by how quickly the field of synthetic embryology is moving, right? So this is a human gastroloid with a neural tube and somites, right? And so you can actually model a lot of human development in a dish. We can introduce arbitrary variation with CRISPR at scale, and increasingly we can record and, and profile both past and present in each of those mutants. And so I think there's a powerful possibilities here for kind of you know, the synthetic genetics or human genetics in the dish um, that I think will play out over the coming years. Um, and thanks for your attention. Uh, these are all the people who did the work. I tried to highlight the names along the way, but again, uh, very honored to, to receive this uh, award and, and thank you for, for listening.